The first team to present is One Acre Coffee Company. It uh, has a newly iced coffee product, which is vastly different than what you find at traditional coffee shops. It's sourced directly from one and two acre farms and cold brewed, so it's smoother and less bitter than conventional coffees. It has an innovative way to dispense it uh, with stations that are fast, efficient, and sustainable that provide uh, cost savings for both consumers and coffee growers. So with that, let me uh, welcome to the stage uh, One Acre. And we will have a timer here at the front, which I think the uh, students are familiar with and the judges will see as well to help manage the time. And that's partly my responsibility as well. So welcome. Coffee Company, and I'm Connor Olke. No, you're good. So a little industry overview, or a little overview about myself. Um, I came from two backgrounds, craft beer and coffee. Uh, I started homebrewing beer about five years ago, and had a draft beer system in my house uh, for three years. Uh, the craft beer movement in the past five or six years has really been incredible. Um, there's new things happening every single day. There's a, a number of new breweries opening. Um, so my original dreams of opening a brewery were crushed when I saw the statistic that 23 craft breweries are currently in New Hampshire and 26 are opening this year. So no thank you. <laughs> um, a quick industry overview, it's a $19.6 billion industry and it's the fastest growing sector of the restaurant, uh, of the alcoholic beverage market. On the coffee side of things, I started as a caffeine addict, as most people do, and then I moved on to the artisan side of things, the roasting, the hot side techniques, such as pour overs, French press, um, vacuum pots, pretty much anything that you can think of, I dabbled with it. An industry review of that, it's a $28 billion industry in the United States alone, and it's the second most valuable commodity after oil. It's the fastest growing sector of its business, uh, the restaurant business, with 7% annual growth, and the US is the number one consumer of coffee at 400 uh, million cups of coffee per, per day. So I saw a unique opportunity here. Um, coffee is a high volume, high overhead business. It's very expensive to start a coffee shop, maintain a coffee shop, especially when you consider the fact that their sales dollars are so low and they need to make it up with volume. Typically it's a large trained staff. Uh, the real estate is expensive, it's in cities, uh, market, you know, basically anywhere that people are, real estate is expensive and they face those costs. So a typical kiosk can be anywhere from fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars, and a coffee house typically starts at about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I thought, what if we could eliminate these costs and make this a scalable business? I have really no interest in opening a coffee shop, but I am interested in the scalable side of things. So that brings us to One Acre. One Acre is a network of self-serve coffee stations serving direct trade, cold brew, nitrogen iced coffee. It's a lot of very confusing terms, and I'll touch upon on all of them uh, in, the, in the next slides. But essentially, we face none of the existing coffee shop problems. Uh, it's a fraction of the, of the price to open our coffee shops. They take up 25 square feet, so real estate can be cheap. They can be in high foot traffic locations, such as outside of this building in, in the Paul College lobby. Uh, the staff is small. We can essentially make one delivery every morning. And uh, other than that, the, the stations are self-serve. And there's zero loss of product, which is a result of our process. So our process starts with cold brew. Uh, this is nothing revolutionary. Essentially all we're doing is steeping coffee grounds in cold water for 18 to 24 hours. Um, the important thing to note here is that there's no chemical reaction. Uh, this is extremely beneficial for a bunch of reasons, which um, you'll see. Um, so yeah, the coffee is then nitrogenated uh, after being kegged in traditional craft beer kegs. And this is under high pressure, high pressure nitrogen gas. Unlike carbonation, it's not acidic, it's not bitter. It actually results in a very smooth Guinness-like um, coffee pour. So it's dispensed from sap taps, which exist in bars today, um, dispensing Guinness. So a lot of our advantages come from our, both our process and our stations themselves. They're faster and more efficient than coffee shops. They can be, um, the transaction costs are estimated to be less than a minute for most 
porous. There's no lines as a result, and there's no complicated orders. There's no triple venti chai latte, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's cheaper by volume. It's 250 for 16 ounces as our price point. Uh, there's no ice in our product, which is different than iced coffee, obviously. But um, the advantage is that it's less diluted, and we don't get the um, the negative aspects of ice. It's a healthy alternative, so there's no cream or sugar added, even though it tastes creamy and there's less bitterness and acidity than traditional iced coffee. Uh, I've had three tastings now with coffee with cream and sugar out for all of them, and one person has used them over probably 400 samples. It's really actually blew me away. And the shelf life is two weeks because of the process. Um, there's no oxygen in the kegs, there's no staling, there's no chemical reaction, so nothing starts to break down. And this opens up a lot of possibilities for us. We can take some craft beer concepts, such as aging in oak barrels, infusing split vanilla beans, uh, fresh fruit in the kegs, um, chocolate in the kegs, basically things that coffee hasn't really seen before. And it's sustainably sourced. So sustainability, I went to look for a supply chain of coffee and found that fair trade was doing a lot of good for larger plantations and corporations, but it wasn't doing really anything for these small one to two acre farms. So using um, current supply chain sources that are from roasters locally, we're going to go directly to farms, purchase the beans in essentially their entire crop at once from these small farms, um, bring them home, roast them here, and then they get used to our coffee. This is both good for them and us. We can see the product before we buy it, we know the quality, and we can help them improve their farms, improve their, um, improve their operation, and everybody wins. So how do we make money? So uh, this started out as a retail-only operation. The idea started probably nine months ago now, and these were going to be coffee shops. However, in the last couple of days, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a, really an explosive amount of new opportunities for these coffee stations. So the retail sales model is your coffee shop model, your pay per cup. Um, it's useful in places that have any high traffic areas. So colleges, large businesses, hospitals, even temporary venues, charity events. Um, you know, races, anything like that. This implements profit sharing to pay for our rent. Uh, so 25% of our profits go back to the host buildings and that is their incentive to both keep them clean and presentable and it also is the reason that they're going to allow us to get there in the first place. And the best part about this is if our sales aren't what we project, we can just move them. It's, you know, 25 square feet. It takes about two hours to pick that thing up and move it to the next, to the next location. The next opportunity came from the Bud Alvin Challenge Round, um, where Beth, from this, who is the CEO of the New England Rest Inns and Restaurants Association, um, came up to me and said, we want these in our hotels. So rather than having the existing coffee bar, which takes a lot of manpower to operate, it's expensive, um, it's not their business, we replaced the coffee bar with these stations. Uh, the kegs are monitored by us at home, so we know before they run out, we can always make sure they're pouring coffee, we make sure it's always fresh. So this is contractual based, and we would do deliveries again, as in basically as much as the demand um, anticipates. So hotel lobbies, high ticket sales, car dealerships, banks, gyms, doctor's office, even grocery and retail stores, which often offer free coffee, but uh, typically nobody drinks it because it's grocery store free coffee. Um, <laughs> So some of the advantages, you know, again, it takes the manpower out, takes the manpower out and it um, just replaces and differentiates this hotel or bank or anything from their competitors, which is typically very competitive, very crowded industries. And our last and final revenue stream is bars and restaurants. So this is our first, uh, first real pursuit. We want to use the fact that they have both the distribution system and they have the equipment that they need to sell our coffee. Um, we're going to sort of piggyback off the craft beer distribution and our margins are the same, if not a little bit better than craft beer. Uh, we typically pay about $50 in materials for a keg and they, um, they sell for about $125. It's a completely new product and it sort of hits on four different um, selling points for, our, for those consumers. It's the end and the beginning of the night, people. It's the, you know, I need some energy before I go out. I need some energy at the end of the night before I drive home or go on to the next or anything of the sort. Uh, it changes the bar mixology complete landscape. It's, you know, you can do mudslides, Irish coffees, uh, cocktails, things that we haven't even really thought of yet because there are so many new options with this on tap. It's also for the designated drivers and the uncomfortable non-drinkers, the people that are at the bar and they want to look like they're fitting the scene. They have what looks like a Guinness in their hand, 
but it's not Guinness, it's coffee. And restaurants, um, you know, on the beach in Portsmouth or on the water in Portsmouth, it's just a completely new method that is both easier than their method and it's better for their, it's up, for their customers. So we did some brief market research with those, um, with those tastings. So we found that 67% would purchase this coffee more than, uh, more than twice a week and 30% would purchase it uh, one to four times a month. One person out of 43 polled would never purchase our coffee. Um, our price point is actually a little bit low. It's, it typically we're looking at between $2.50 and $3.00, so we can improve our margins a little bit and add the sales tax back into the equation. And we found that 84% drink coffee year-round and only 16% um, switch to hot coffee during the winter. New England is very weird in that it's 20 degrees outside and everyone is still drinking iced coffee. It still blows my mind enough. I've lived here my entire life. So investment in growth. So the best, the best uh, aspect of the business for me is it's a very low barrier to entry. The equipment is cheap to purchase and it's easy for us to grow, but it's also very easy for our competitors to jump in and steal our market share before we've even gotten off the ground. So we want to focus on brand promotion and growth uh, to protect our image and basically constantly um, innovate through recipe design. So a quick statement, cash flows don't have time to go through this all, but essentially we need about $100,000 for break even in six months. Um, $500,000 are our sales projection for the end of um, the first year. Any questions? Excellent presentation. I also loved uh, reading over your proposal. Uh, you've got a good knack for sales and advertising. Thank you. Uh, so my question, one verb that you used in there on the patent, you said it could be patent. And so I think that it would be great to just get more clarification on whether it could or couldn't because you've got a unique product and if it can't be patented, others are gonna quickly come in. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm not a patent law expert by any means, um, but the system that we're currently using exists in Mars. It's just the draft equipment that they currently use. Uh, but there's also a lot of room for improvement in this system. It's what I had available, and it's the capital I had to put into this, and now we're at the line, and you know, there's room for growth, and I think a actual coffee nitrogen tap can be developed and can be patented, for sure. Uh, I would echo um, Allison's kind remarks, so kudos to you for your energy and work. Um, Thank you. One of the things that strikes me is that part of the financial success uh, on a pro forma basis is your ability to, as you say, go direct to these small farms to source your beans and cut out the incremental cost structure between. Why are you able to do that and why aren't more people doing that? So big, uh, you know, coffee shops and, you know, Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts, they have really high overhead and they need to, you know, they need to find the 67 pound beans, the 97 pound beans. The, really the cost difference between a five pound roasted market price bean and the you know, craft one acre farm bean is about a dollar per pound, which is not a significant impact on our sales forecast. It is, but at the same time, it's one differentiating factor that I think people are really gonna, really gonna like and really gonna attach, attach onto. Yeah, some samples for you guys. Again, nice presentation. Um, it, I couldn't see in uh, your document that you included the cost of getting the beans from these small suppliers to, to you. Um, these other networks have existed for quite a while and that's part of the service that they offer, correct? Do yeah, so the them? idea of its inception was we were gonna do this sourcing. We were gonna go try to find the beans, we were going to um, find these one or two acre farms. But in my own research and my own search for supply, I found that these, these roasters already have these relationships. This is now their business to go find 20, <laughs> one or two of the farms and purchase all of their beans and roast at home. So we get rid of that hassle of trying to do that and trying to figure out that supply chain. That's not our business, so that it's definitely the roaster's business. Um, nice job. Thank you. Um, I'd like a little more clarity on your go-to-market strategy. I see sort of a standalone kiosk here, which is very customer friendly, um, but it also seems to be there's an opportunity to be more of a commercial behind-the-counter um, solution. Uh, what, what's your plan and how, how would you differentiate between those two opportunities? So really, uh, my conversation with Beth at the uh, Inns and Restaurants Association, uh, I think there's a lot to 
if we can sign contracts with places like this, we could either build them into their existing coffee bar so that we can sort of get rid of the hassle of building this whole station and just focus on making a clean um, tap display, essentially. Um, and the restaurants and bars, they already have these taps. If they can't give up the tap space, we can build very small versions of those where we can just say, you know, here's your first K free, here, here it is, you don't need to take a tap off, you don't need to do anything, so. And the $100,000 investment includes um, the, the maintenance and operation of brewing and distributing the coffee to the, um, to the locations? Yeah, so I actually factored in uh, direct labor of delivery and um, brewing coffee into my cost calculations. So our margins are about 50% once you include those. Um, it's, really, it's really simple to brew this coffee uh, on a labor perspective. Um, it's you know, basically the same amount of effort to brew an entire keg than it is to brew a cappuccino. It's, um, it's just very scalable in that way. So much like a craft brewery would. Good work. Uh, I have an operation question, uh, which is how do you maintain and secure these, uh, these uh, facilities in a freestanding uh, site. Right, so we want to focus on places that have eyes on them. Um, we, you know, somewhere like a lobby, there's somebody going to be at the desk the whole time. No one is going to come up and try to take it. Maybe they will, but that's hopefully not the norm. Um, and other than that, we, you know, basically anywhere that we can establish high traffic locations where people are also there and watching these. And again, that profit sharing is the incentive to keep them clean, keep them there, you know, and keep them from being damaged. You uh, commented that perhaps you could place these in the smaller hotels and replace what they currently have out in the morning for their guests, but isn't that mostly hot coffee? It is, so we've looked into um, doing hot, this coffee hot. I don't know, I really think it's possible. I, the, the real thing that we need to focus on is heating it up on the way out. Uh, you lose that shelf life once you start to store hot coffee, but the way that an espresso machine works is it has cold water, heats it up, and, and shoots it out, right? You know, just from the, room, the difference between room temperature and cold coffee, that nitrogen head and foam seems to stick around, so I think it's, I think it's doable hot, it's just, outside of my current scope. One of the things as you launch this is getting your niche, getting your brand. I know you said that you would maybe have some of the coffee growers uh, highlighted at each of the stations yep. to, to, to build brand awareness and loyalty. I don't know if I saw though in your cash flow you had advertising dollars in there. Because that's going to be a very big expense that you need to have. Absolutely, yeah. So the the actually my original uh, business model was this was going to be my thing on the side. Um, it was you know if nobody believes in me, I'm still going to do this because I believe in it. Um, but I have actually reworked all of the cash flows to account for the larger scale that I'm talking about now. Uh, but I believe the cash flows that you guys have was on this one coffee station scale. So. So Connor, just one final question for me. Uh, assuming you're going to have a decaf offering as well. I do. Yeah, I actually have some. Have some little. Okay, good, good, yep. good. I switched a little while ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just want to clarify who is currently in the space because in the narrative that we were provided prior to the uh, discussion today, it indicated that um, our, our quality is assured through our cold brewing method, a practice used only infrequently by small coffee shops. So, are others doing what you're doing? Other people are cold brewing coffee. Cold brewing coffee has been around for a very, very long time. It's, it's, not, it's just putting coffee grounds in water. Um, the point of differentiation is this nitrogen system. Cold brew coffee by itself is just a less bitter alternative to hot coffee cooled down. Um, so there's, you know, even Starbucks recently did a small batch cold brew, but again, it's just, you know, steeping coffee grounds in water. Um, the advantage that I see is truly in the nitrogen uh, dispensing system. Um, one more operational question. Uh, you mentioned that you would get alerts to when kegs were low or nitrogen was low. Is that technology developed and have you integrated into the system yet? There's, it's not integrated in this system and the and flow control is also not integrated in this system. Uh, on the retail side of things, we want to sort of make sure that 16 ounces is being dispensed if that's what you pay for. But as far as monitoring the kegs, we can either do it by uh, weight, we can put them on scales and measure how much is left or we can do flow control measurement, as in there's you know, 140 in this keg, and now 100 are gone, it's time to re-deliver soon. So, but that'll all be you know, integrated into their, into their network and information back to us. You mentioned that uh, you're gonna be using oak casks. Uh, 
where, where are they sourced, uh, especially if you build up to the size you're talking about, and are they going to be uh, uh, unused, fresh, brand new, or you know, from somebody else, or, and are they reusable? Yeah, so the, the idea that we can, you know, it's more for an illustrated point, I think that we can certainly look into the whiskey barrel aged, you know, iced coffee, especially in a bar setting when you're, you know, not drinking, but you're still a drinker. Um, but that being said, I don't anticipate every coffee we make going through an oak barrel. Um, it's not a reasonable expectation, they're also very expensive. Um, but typically they come from, you know, micro distilleries or... Um, that might be a problem for someone who's an alcoholic. Yes, true. Um, yeah, and, then, and again, it's you know something that we can look at as we go forward. But really, the exciting part is that now that we have the shelf life, we can do so many things that craft beer has been running with, such as fresh fruit and things like that. You made a very astute point to say in the beginning that you want to really emphasize the brand and get out there. I would encourage you to just brand it. Yeah. Hire somebody, a brander, get a really clever name, then even if you can't have deep IP or wide IP, you've got a brand that you could promote and nail the market. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not completely sold on one acre, but I think there's definitely an opportunity here for, um, for branding going forward and a really positive brand image. Talk a little more about sort of uh, how you're thinking through the logistics of keeping um, this sustained. So if I look at this, uh, you know, I think about at work, the coffee area could get pretty darn messy. So if you have it as independent standalone, talk about how you think that maybe you can do a cost arrangement with the building or the company that you have it with, because that's going to be very important to keep it, the, you know, cleanliness yeah. there. Yeah, they get, I mean, coffee bars get trashed. Um, the, the, really, the idea there on the retail side of things is that profit sharing. You know, 25% of every sale in a high traffic location is a significant amount of money to these, to these locations. It is our rent, in a way, so we can afford to do it. But it's an incentive, because people aren't going to buy coffee from a coffee station that's covered in, you know, just coffee and creamers and all of that. Um, so on that side, we're hoping that the, that's enough of an incentive to keep them clean. It's also worth noting that we could essentially have, once we have the network set up, have somebody go around and, you know, in this, you know, 45 minute drive, service at the station every day, so that we can constant cleaning. Um, and then on the, in the hotel lobby, customer service side, we're hoping that the, the hotels that take this on want to make it look good, they want people to, you know, they want to offer this, they're proud of it, they're, you know, they think it's cool and they don't want it to be trash. So again, it's sort of a good faith. This is a benefit for both of us. So let's, you know, let's try to keep them clean, but we'll tackle it as we go forward. So is there actually a money, like a vending machine? Is there a money collection uh, gadget built into this? So this one does not have one, uh, but essentially what we're gonna do is incorporate the Square Pay iPad systems. They are incredibly easy to do. It's one click, it's $2, swipe your card, and that's it. There's no signature required. Um, we're looking into options about how to store cash if people want to pay with cash, but change also becomes an issue. Uh, so they may be credit card only or card only, which in our current state is not going to be necessarily a bad thing. Um, but yeah, the money, the payment system will be built into the system and secured so it can't be removed or stolen. It's great. One other market to explore as you think about is the not-for-profit, because I could see that this would have a great benefit uh, for some of them, too, where you could share your revenues. Yeah, absolutely, especially our temporary venues, like dropping this off for a, a charity 4K or, you know, really, it, there's, there's almost too many places to look at right now, which we need to just pick some and start there, you know. This is, people have wonderful ideas, and it's awesome to hear that so many venues. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks.